I'm not officially taught starting yet. Just want to say hello since I'm standing here and you're all looking at me. <laughs> just wondering a little bit who we have here. Some of y'all are students, I know, right? Student editors. And, and I, I'm guessing we have some faculty here too and some friends, colleagues of Jamie Jones. Cool, cool. Um, I, I met Jamie in 1992, which is a really long time ago, um, just casually at a sort of poetry event. And then I didn't, I met him again when he, when he went to New York to get his MFA in Brooklyn. And, and we reconnected, but I didn't, um, I didn't remember at first. So it's like we were sitting there having dinner together. And then he reminded me we had met. So it's kind of cool. We have a long association. He's a good guy. <laughs> Good, good, yeah, thank you. And I've been down to Pensacola once before, too. I came down in uh, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and I read at, what's the name of that bookstore? Open Books. Open Books, gave a reading at Open Books, and then we drove to New Orleans and gave a reading there, too. So that was a good time. Yeah. Did you start without me? Uh, I was standing up here, and everyone was looking at me, so I thought I'd better say something. Better say something, right? Yeah. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. I know most of you. Uh, I'm Jamie Jones. I uh, teach English, literature, and creative writing here at Pensacola State College. Uh, and I'm the faculty editor of Hurricane Review, our national journal. Um, this is Sarah Smith right here. She's the faculty editor advisor of the Kilgore Review. We have two amazing journals. And there, there's copies of each of those journals over there at the table. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Edmund Berrigan here today. Um, we've been friends for, I don't know, quite a while, I guess. Um, I told him I met you in 1992. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't exactly really get to know each other until about 15 years later. Yeah, Something yeah. Something like that. I and mean, just cross paths, you know, one of those ways. Um, anyway, Eddie is a terrific poet. Uh, I'm a fan of his poems. There's so much curiosity and wonder and wit and wordplay and depth in those poems. They're really, really wonderful. Um, and on top of that, as you all know, because you've seen the information, he is uh, also an editor. He's got a lot of his things here that he's edited and written different books. Um, and he also, you know, I don't want to tell him any more about you because he's going to say all that, but he's got a diverse experience in editing, you know, which I think is so significant. And um, yeah, I'm so glad to have him here. Please welcome Edmund Berrigan. <laughs> nice. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, well, you tell me, is my mic working? Can everybody hear me at like this volume? Do I need to be a little louder for y'all in the back? Is it on? Testing? All right. Um, OK, well, hi. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for showing up. Um, I'm excited and nervous, as one always is, before a talk. You know, it's, uh, it's important energy to be used in the, in the presentation. Jamie asked me to come down here maybe just a month ago, so it, it was kind of quick. I knew I needed to talk on writing and editing, but you know, the first step is always what form is it going to take? What, like, I knew I had the information already, so, but how was I going to do it? So what I, I came up with is um, sort of a two-part talk. There's maybe like eight or nine pages here. Uh, the first part's going to be on my professional work as a copy editor, which is business work. Uh, I'll tell you a lot more about it. And then, um, and then part two is going to be about my life as a poet, as a writer, um, I come from a family of poets, so these aren't all my books, but these are books by members of my family, too. I was just thinking, you know, I'm going to give you a bunch of words, but if you feel like coming up after and just taking a look and seeing what, what they all actually look like, you're certainly welcome to. And then, uh, and then I'll read you a few poems. And then we can, you know, if you have any questions, comments, um, mild criticisms, I'll, I'll be happy to accept those. Um, all right. So I'm just going to read to you for a little bit first. Uh, so I call this On Writing and Editing, a talk for student editors and staff at the Pensacola State College. Part one, my professional life as an editor. 
Also, I didn't know how to start, so I just started with my name, even though you already know it. So just bear with me for the first five words. My name is Edmund Joseph Berrigan. I'm 48 years old, and I'm a poet. Being a poet, in most cases, means having a profession that doesn't generate a livable income. And so I've had to seek other means to generate income. I've mainly worked as a copy editor since 2000. I've had two long-term jobs and many more short assignments. A copy editor, if you don't know, is simply a person who reads copy and edits it, fixing typos, making grammatical suggestions, calling out inaccuracies, helping streamline the flow of a piece of writing and ensuring that the copy fits the stylistic standards of the source of publication or the presentation, like this one. My first job was at a B2B, that's business to business magazine, called Chemical Week. This is a news publication that covers the global chemical industry. Uh, they interview executives, cover plant openings, and track environmental regulations and legislation that would affect the chemical industry. And actually, the Gulf of Mexico would come up quite a lot. Whenever uh, a hurricane would occur that would, that would close a plant for a little while, they declare force majeure, which sort of means an act of God, which is kind of like the greatest phrase ever. You know, if you need to, you know, if you run into problems, if you're delayed in traffic, you could just say it's force majeure. It was an act of God. So uh, anyway. Strangely, I was hired at Chemical Week because I was a poet. The lead copy editor there was a poet and friend of mine, and he convinced his bosses to hire me as an assistant copy editor. Doesn't usually work this way. I didn't even have to take a copy editing test. But this time, it did work, and I had my first full-time 9 to 5 job at 26. I worked there for a year and a half, and I did a good job. But I was laid off when the economy tanked, in the early years of George W. Bush's first term as president. I was somewhat distraught, uh, but I proceeded to look for a job anyway. I was still looking when the events of September 11, 2001 happened. I was staying in an old sewing factory in Brooklyn, and I could see the two smoking towers from the roof. Three weeks later, I was hired by a temp agency that had been contracted by one of the construction companies that were working at the site of the attack in New York. It was now being called Ground Zero. I had a night shift from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Initially, I was issuing security passes to construction workers, not that I had any security credentials myself. But mostly I sat there doing nothing all night. Um, really, it was about half an hour worth of work, and then it would run up because who's coming to a construction site at 8, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Um, later on, I was moved to a reception desk in a building where the workers were storing their belongings, essentially just making sure no one stole their stuff while they searched through the rubble. So they were doing the heroic stuff. I was bizarrely just sitting there all night. I would have dinner at a Salvation Army or a Red Cross tent that was set up in the, in the middle of one of the closed off streets in the middle of the avenue. After a few months, that work dried up. My poet friend from Chemical Week had been publishing an independent literary magazine, which he called Boog City. This was named after the baseball player Boog Powell, a third baseman who played for the Baltimore Orioles in, I think, the 60s. Uh, I was helping him copy edit that publication for free. Um, and in fact, he was a little too zealous in his work, and he was doing it at Chemical Week. And they caught on. They gave him a lot of leeway, but he wouldn't stop, so they, they fired him. I happened to be copy editing for him the day he was fired. So with his encouragement, I called up Chemical Week, and they hired me back in his place. And thus, I was promoted to copy editor. Um, though I was a creative writer, I did not want to take on additional writing responsibilities at work. I wanted to save that energy for myself. But the economy turned again in 2008, 2009, when the housing bubble burst during the first years of the Obama administration. And I was laid off again. See, it didn't matter whether it was Republicans or Democrats. It was the economic cycle itself. This time, I didn't get hired back. The chemical week well had run dry. I applied for a job through an employment agency they had been contracted to hire a freelance medical copy editor and were willing to train in AMA style, which stands for American Medical Association. 
I went out and bought an AMA style guide, leafed through it, and bookmarked any pages that seemed relevant. It's a big book, it's like 500 pages. I bought the copy to my interview, I interviewed well, and then I took a copy editing test, which I passed. I found out later they interpreted my bringing the style guide as showing initiative, and they hired me as a freelancer, and I copy edited basically pharmaceutical advertisements. Uh, pharma information is federally regulated, and it needs to be accurate, so the role of a copy editor has a lot more value. They couldn't, I had more job stability is what I mean, like they couldn't quite afford to let me go the same way the chemical business magazine could, which was full of other levels of editors um, beyond the copy editor. So I worked, I freelanced for a year and a half there, and then eventually I was hired by Medscape, which is a, a division of WebMD. And it was directly because I had this medical experience. I evaluated editorial tasks. Uh, well, sorry, skipped ahead there. I've been at WebMD for about 10 years now, half of them as a medical copy editor, and then I was promoted to what they call a resource manager. So I evaluate editorial tasks and I assign them to editors. I provide timing and structure for these tasks, solve problems, provide support. I run meetings on a daily basis. I've managed people. But wherever I can do so responsibly, I also attend to my literary life. Because ultimately, I'm a poet first. And my full-time job, to me, it's just a side gig I use to support myself and to grow my editing skills. So that's part one. Part two, my literary life. Both of my parents are poets. So is my brother. My stepfather was also a poet, and so are a large number of my friends. I began writing poetry when I was eight years old because it was part of what was going on around me. First, I wrote poems in collaboration with my parents, mostly my mother, but occasionally my father. Unfortunately, my father died about a month before my ninth birthday, so my window was short there. Now, my dad is Ted Berrigan. He was born in 1934 in Providence, Rhode Island. He joined the army to leave Rhode Island, basically. And he was sent to Korea in the 50s during the Korean War, but he didn't see any action. From there, he was stationed in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he attended the University of Tulsa through the GI Bill, which is another government program that paid for college education for a lot of people, especially in my dad's generation. Dad, he had begun writing poetry as a child, but he began writing poetry uh, with a sincere interest while, while he was in Tulsa, and he met other poets. From there, he moved to New York. In New York in the early 60s, Dad hit his stride, publishing books, making friends with famous poets such as Allen Ginsberg, Frank O'Hara. He found his way into the circles of Andy Warhol, hanging out at his factory. And he began writing art reviews as well for a while in the mid-60s for uh, art news and for a magazine called Culture. Now, Dad only would take work related to poetry. He chose a bohemian-type lifestyle, and he became well-known for his poems. The this, uh, this success was important. My mother is Alice Notley, who's now 78 years old. She's published over 40 books of poetry. Um, she publishes with Penguin, which is about as good publishing as you can get for a poet. Also, she came and read her poems and gave a workshop at Pensacola State College in 2019. I have a sneaking suspicion Jamie Jones had something to do with that. Like my dad, she's managed to have a lifestyle where she didn't take work that wasn't related to poetry. This involved a lot of luck, but also a simple lifestyle and a willingness to live in poverty at times. She gets paid to travel to universities and institutions in the US and Europe and give readings and has won numerous prizes. Uh, that gives her a, a little more flexibility. And I didn't write this down, but I was, growing up, I thought I was going to have that same lifestyle. So it's kind of shocking to me that I've had like nine to five jobs for 20, 25 years. But the, uh, the economic landscape changed. The price of housing changed. Um, when, they, when they were in New York, when dad was in New York in the 60s, it was super cheap. Uh, and even when we moved back to New York after I was born in the 70s, it was still very affordable. But the New York that I came into as an adult, that was not an option. Um, 
So anyway, back to the story. When I was 16, mom gave me a blank notebook. One night, I watched an episode of Quantum Leap, uh, which starts Scott Bakula. Uh, it's a show essentially about time travel. It's a little, about a little bit more than that, but I don't want to talk about TV too much. Um, this particular episode involved a somewhat tacky characterization of the beatnik writer Jack Kerouac. My dad had interviewed Kerouac for the Paris Review in 1968, shortly before Kerouac died. Kerouac's book of poetry were literally next to me in a small bookcase. The show ended, I laughed it off, it was very hokey, and I grabbed my notebook with a burst of energy and went out into the streets of New York and I wrote six poems that night about what I saw. I decided that night that I was a full-time poet. I was lucky to already be in an environment where I had access to contemporary poetry. My experience in reg regular education was often discouraging in this aspect. I would be told that poetry was hard to understand, that only a few people could understand it. I didn't see the hypocrisy in that view at the time, but I did feel it. For example, most people relate to music without understanding it. The listener recognizes words, emotional tones, recognizes the moods that it puts them in. But the casual, li casual listener doesn't know what key a song is in or understand all of the lyrics. In fact, misunderstanding lyrics is often one of the funnest parts about listening to music. But when it comes to poetry, not understanding it is somehow considered a tragedy, something that should make you turn away from it. As I was growing into an adult, I was beginning to understand that there was a hole in my life, the place where my father should have been. Part of the reason I wrote was just to reach out to him. Sometimes this would happen in direct ways, direct addresses, but often it was abstract and at times it resisted meaning. I didn't know exactly what I was feeling. It was just about the emotional resonance. It was about not knowing what happened to him or what would happen to him not knowing if I would see him again. Uh, on some level, I just simply wanted to make art also. As simple as a child drawing a picture but not knowing what it would be until it just felt done. It's done when you say it's done. It's a feeling, it's not a definition. I didn't need to study poetry in a university setting. I already had access to, to contemporary poetry circles but I wanted to be surrounded by a creative community. It was crucial then, and it's still crucial, to have people to be inspired by who respond to your work. Even when you disagree with your community, you can't even know that without them having provided you feedback in the first place. So I continued my studies on my own, but I shared the results with my friends. And I helped to organize readings, I helped to edit literary publications. I graduated from Purchase and moved to San Francisco, where my brother Anselm with Berrigan was living. He had gone to SUNY Buffalo and began writing music reviews for the school publication. I think it's called The Prodigal Son. Those music reviews turned into him writing short stories. And those stories turned into poems. So his path was a little different than mine. He's two years older than me. He had moved to San Francisco a couple years before me and befriended a group of writers who considered themselves to be experimental poets. In some sense, just writing poetry is experimental if you approach it with a sense of wonder and a sense of exploration. It's also revolutionary in a certain sense. Taking part in a generally non-monetary generating activity, I'll say that again, taking part in a generally non-monetary generating activity in a capitalist society could be considered radical. Doesn't mean revolutionary, it doesn't mean you're attacking anybody or doing anything mean, it just means you're doing something outside of the general flow of um, you know, societal and cultural movement. It doesn't have to be evil, it can be friendly. Um, the people I met were very smart. They were consciously trying to be different at their craft than those who they, they were learning it from, who were basically an older generation of experimental poets. People people my dad's age and younger. How much we succeeded, they succeeded or didn't is a much longer and it's a changing story and it hasn't ended yet. We're still finding that out. Sometimes, uh, you know, 
Sometimes it's not till someone dies and their work is out there that people, that the culture like catches up with them and understands what they were doing, which is rather unfortunate for the artists themselves, but so be it. After three years in San Francisco, I felt the call of my hometown and I moved back to New York City where I've lived ever since. Since then, I've had three books of poetry published, an experimental memoir, and many short books of poetry, which are called chapbooks. They sort of look like this. They tend to be like 20, 25 pages. Full-length book of poetry is like 80 pages, so it's shorter than a novel. I mean, some people write books of poetry, like my mom, that are like, could be 200, 300 pages, but that takes a lot of time and effort and energy. It's a special kind of output. Uh, I've also edited or co-edited collections of other people's poetry. The poetry books have mostly been with small presses. These are usually one or two person operations, and they require a lot of personal time and effort from the publisher. These are labors of love by people who see the value of producing this art despite it not being lucrative. Often these books, you're, sometimes you're lucky if they break even. This is how most poetry gets published, but there are larger presses. More than 20 years after the death of my dad, my mother, my brother, and I co-edited the collected poems of Ted Berrigan, which is this big, thick thing right here. It was published in 2005 by the University of California. This is a major publication for a poet, and it represented almost the entire body of his poetic writing. A shorter volume, The Selected Poems of Ted Berrigan, was published by the, by the University of California in 2011. These were major steps in helping to cement the legacy of my father's writing, just making sure that it was available, that it would last. Meanwhile, my brother had a book published by City Lights, the publishing arm of the famous bookstore in San Francisco. Brought it in right here, rated it from Jamie's library about half an hour ago. Um, City Lights, you may know this already, is especially known for publishing Howl by Allen Ginsberg. When the book was originally published in the 50s, it was printed abroad and intercepted by a U.S. customs agent for being considered obscene. The poem includes depictions of intimacy in both hetero and homosexual relations. There was a famous trial, uh, often called the Howell Obscenity Trial, which City Lights won, and in which the judge ruled that Howell was not obscene, but instead was artistic expression with cultural value. This ruling paved the way for other banned books to be printed again in the US, including books by D.H. Lawrence and Henry Miller. Not bad for a poem, you know? Um, as you may be aware, the conversations over free speech and publication continue to ripple through our culture to this day. I hear this is happening in Florida, you know? Um, telling the truth as one may perceive it is often contentious. It's worth repeating that poetry can often be on the pulse of this conversation. It's a language art, and it's intermingled with truth-telling. My brother's book, Free Cell, did not run up against these type of issues, and neither did mine, which is called More Gone, which is this one right here. Nice big bright yellow. Um, it was published in 2019, and it was an honor to have a book come out from a publisher with such a powerful history. And City Lights, they're kind of a major publisher, but they almost operate like a, a small press. But they have, they have enough prestige um, to sort of attract a wider audience, and they have a little bit more resources. But as I found out, it's, it's still just a small operation of a handful of people. Uh, there's a series editor for this. There's a main editorial director. They have marketing, which I would most small press publications have no marketing, and um, and it's like they're allergic to it. So you know you end up having to do a lot of it yourself. Um, oh yeah, incidentally, I didn't submit my manuscript to the editor of the series, Garrett Caples, or try to put any pressure on him. Uh, he's also a poet. And I had a chance to meet him in a friendly setting. I simply gave him one of my chapbooks. I uh, didn't say anything about it, just said, here, this is for you, uh, just to make him aware of my work. When he was in a good spot, he chose to reach out to me and ask me for a manuscript. Publishing is a kind of partnership, 
And just being a good writer often isn't enough. The idea of what the author is writing needs to have synergy with the publisher's idea of what they're working towards. Publishers also have a vision of who they are, of what they want to choose to represent. In smaller operations, it's even more crucial to respect these visions and the boundaries, as that publisher is often making a sacrifice of their time and personal resources. Each publication is a personal endeavor, kind of like a friendship, and it requires understanding from both sides. After the publication of my father's body of poems, there was a collection of prose writing that was left. Um, this consisted of art and book reviews, journals, and other types of miscellaneous writing. And just to add to that, my dad, in some sense, I would say he was a formalist. And that just means that he was interested in form. But he also, some of his book reviews suspiciously resembled poems. Um, and you know, sometimes he might write a one-page play. There's, there's one in here that's basically about the New York Jets. You know, it's humorous. And it's, it's an experiment in form in the same way. So this is the kind of writing that we had. Uh, my mother and brother and I once again took it upon ourselves to assemble a collection. And dad had died before the computer era. And so the writing had all been typed on typewriters. A lot of it was just Xeroxes of publications because he hadn't even kept copies of his own writing. We had to retype everything from the original manuscripts or from the publications. This took a few years. We didn't have a support, you know, we didn't have a publisher, so it was up to us. Along the way, we picked up another editor, a poetry scholar named Nick Sturm. This is just to prove also that there are people out there who are interested in poetry who aren't poets. Um, not everybody believes that. But um, my dad had sold his journals and papers to many libraries and institutions over the course of his life. This was one of the ways he made money. He would sell books. Um, he was also sly, and, and sometimes he would, he would forge signatures of the author. Um, to the, to the point where the poet John Ashbery once gave him a, a book, and, um, and I think he, you know, expressly telling him not to, not to sell it. And I believe a short time later, he went into a bookstore and found that copy with my dad having written his name on the bottom just to get a couple more bucks. Um, so yeah, Nick, Nick Sturm would track down these journals. He would go to the libraries. He would transcribe the writing from them. And he would send it to us. He was also, he was also studying my mother's work. Um, in fact, there's an account of my own birth that Nick found this way in a journal and sent to us. And between you and me, I am not always able to handle the emotions that situations like this bring up. But I persevere out of a sense of obligation and because I believe in the value of making this writing available. Uh, but it is uncomfortable at times. Now, Garrett submitted the assembled manuscript of my dad's prose writing titled, Get the Money, which is kind of a comment on, on his lifestyle and the choices he made. But it's also the um, kind of thing that Damon Runyon would say or that you would see in like a noir gangster movie. There's usually somebody with a gun in their hand and a long trench coat saying, get the money. Um, so he submitted this manuscript to the editorial director at City Lights. They accepted it. Ultimately, they chose to make it the lead book for the fall of 2022, so they put a little extra marketing push on it. This also meant the bulk of the production work was being done during the lonely stretch of COVID isolation that we all went through. I was no longer working in the corporate office of WebMD in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood in New York City. I was working full time from home at my desk with two laptops open in front of me. One was my work computer where I worked hard in my day job, and the other was my personal computer, where I'd work on Get the Money in my downtime. I had taken the role of lead editor for this publication. For the selected poems and the collected poems, my mother was really uh, in charge of that. She was the expert. She had all the knowledge. Um, basically, I was the touch point between our group of editors and the City Light staff. I was dealing with correspondence, assembling versions of the manuscript, coordinating the necessary edits, touching base with the City Lights marketing staff, dealing with issues of permissions and copyright, 
and eventually helping to organize publication events. Incredibly, I even found myself appearing via Zoom on a morning talk show called Good Day Tulsa to promote an online event for a bookstore in Tulsa called Magic City. I took a short break from my day job to do the interview for my apartment. I literally asked my boss. I just said, I'm going to need to be unavailable for about 45 minutes. Um, I couldn't see the interviewer. I just heard a disembodied voice. Uh, and I only saw a gray screen with the words, good day, Tulsa, on it. Um, and then there was also that thing where there was a producer voice that came on. That was just like, you're on in 30 seconds. Do you have any questions? I'm like, no. <laughs> Um, so that the inter and uh, the interviewer actually asked me very good questions. I was surprised. You know, they had done they had done their homework, um, and they were interested in anything that that had a connection to Tulsa. So that was primarily what they asked me about. You know, four or five questions. I never did anything like that, but I knew I needed to speak in complete sentences, and I knew that I wasn't going to have a lot of time. So I just tried to answer honestly and openly and quickly. Finally, later that day, I received a clip of the show, and I saw what it actually looked like. Uh, there was this woman with big blonde hair in, a, you know, in a sort of a TV setting, like a talk show setting, like you might imagine, lots of bright colors, pastels. And suddenly, a little rectangle opens up, my goofy face appearing in my apartment with my junk in the background, a little window into Brooklyn. I was taking a sip of my beer as my face popped up. And I started choking on it. And I coughed for 10 minutes. And I was just, you know, I'm just glad I didn't die from, from my one moment of slightly more fame. Um, but part of the point here is that for this last publication, all of my editorial skill set had come into play. Not just from the years of slogging away at poetry, toiling in obscurity, but also the professionalism and dedication I picked up from my non-literary day jobs. My copy editing skills, the ability to communicate professionally and coordinate with others, the ability to multitask and do it well, and understanding how to balance my priorities so that neither area of my work lives was too negatively impacted by it. Not to say that this was easy. At times, it was seriously overwhelming, emotional, confusing. And with the isolation of COVID, it was also very lonely. But I was always confident in my ability to navigate my way to the end. So in true, how long was that? That probably wasn't super long, right? About five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. all right. 20 minutes, minutes. Okay, good, good. Well, I want to leave time for us to talk. Um, in true poetic fashion, I haven't totally figured out what I'm reading. Sometimes you just got to wait for the moment. Uh, but I do secretly also have a plan. Uh, I'm going to read a few short poems, and then I have one longer piece that's about growing up in the, in the East Village in New York. Uh, some of these don't have titles. It's totally OK if your poems don't have titles, in case you didn't know. Um, let's see. We all become each other. Whatever animates one comes into another in fragments. We slowly become each other's gestures, look, impulses, beyond consciousness and cognition. The longer the life, the more lives are accumulated and ultimately redistributed in tiny breaths. All the times I've crossed the Manhattan Bridge, trapped in a grid, but strangely relieved to return to all the energy, little boxes full of totems that make me feel at home. Fight for it every minute, but every minute is proved to belong to no one. Each claim is valid. I know that church on the way to the bridge. It used to be part of my bike path. I hate everything that happened after 1983. Track artists by the cost of their materials. Did he really die? He pops in occasionally, but mostly upstate. I wrote a personal essay about garbage by Jan Cool Crystal Fountain. And on it, I did pile all the flowers of the mountain. Will you go? We'll all go together.
one, there's one in here I do want to read. Thunderstorm. I heard gunfire in the alley last night. Two tentative shots and then four successive, more intended ones. The slow perusing sound of cop cars cruising the street followed and eventually a constant circling of helicopters overhead put me to sleep. I woke a few hours later to bright lightning flashes that were very close, followed by an immense explosion of thunder accompanied by a persistent pounding rain. When I awoke again, it was a bright, quiet morning. I lay in bed and read the news, but there was no indication of either event. I've slept with cramps on a park bench in Queiretro. Children watching in wonder in planes, trains, buses, and cars. I've slept on the ground and woke up in the rain, under and above ground with men, women, children, animals. I've slept through my stop and walked home through the dark streets of Brooklyn's Chinatown fish stands, finally shut away at 3 a.m. I've slept in my dreams and while awake, I've slept in my wounds, waking up in my veins with the blood gushing. You know, you need to know who some poets are in order to ask them to publish. So, um, you know, attending readings and talking to people is the simplest way. If you attend a lot of readings and you go out and talk to people, you just find out who they are and what they're doing. Um, you know, create friendships. And you, you'll have, or, you know, you can take workshops as well. And you can meet people that way. And you just, you find out who you're interested in. But you, it doesn't have to be peers. You can also... One of the interesting things about what my dad did in Tulsa is he befriended uh, the poet Ron Patchen, who is now pretty famous for a poet. He, uh, if you ever heard of the Jim Jarmusch movie, Patterson, it, it contains a lot of poems, and Ron wrote those poems, most of those poems. Ron grew up in Tulsa, and when he was like a teenager, 17, 18, 19, he started a little magazine, eight and a half by 11 staple, called the White Dove Review. And he wrote to Jack Kerouac. He like, found his address. He wrote to Allen Ginsberg. And they sent him back poems because they are also human beings who need to be in communication with other human beings. So uh, a lot of it is just that. Um, it, and it's different. I've edited small magazines like that. And I'll, in those cases, I'll ask my friends, you know, people I know. If there's a co-editor, they, they ask a certain amount of people, and between that, you get like an interesting group. I was on the editorial board for a magazine called Lungful that um, ran about 20 issues. Again, it was published by one guy, but he was proactive enough to get uh, grants from the New York State Council of Arts, which is NISCA. And it's Part of the stipulation to receive that grant was that you had to have an editorial board, so I was on the editorial board, and that you had to accept, you had to open up to publications, people would write to you. So this magazine would be listed somewhere. And so what we would do as the editorial board is go to his house, you know, have some coffee, have some wine, whatever, and pour through these submissions. And a lot of them were not, didn't have anything to do with what was going to be in the magazine. But it was fascinating to see what people are doing. You know, sometimes it's um, someone who's been alive a while who likes to write poems about wine or something like that. So it didn't really fit in the context, but it's someone who's given their time to writing and sort of reaching out. A lot of people will go through lists of publications um, if they're printed somewhere and just send their poems to them blind. Um, but context, context is important. You know, if you know who you're writing for and you gear your work towards it, your chances are much better. Yeah, no, that's, um, there are, well, some, you can advertise, you know, you advertise in other publications if, you, if you're a place like Longful and you don't you, you even have a budget. When I'm doing smaller scale stuff, I actually don't want to take submissions, not because I'm cruel, but actually because it breaks my heart to turn people down and say no. Um, so I try to be very cautious with that. If too many people know that I'm publishing a magazine and someone asks me, I'm very likely to say yes, which might cause me inner turmoil. 
So, you know, it yeah. really depends on what you're doing. Um, how do you approach, I need this reworked, or that whole scenario? Right, editing. Um, yeah, that's interesting. It depends. Again, it depends on the situation. Um, most people don't like being told that work needs to be, you know, that edits are necessary, so it depends. Okay, but I, I can tell you, I've submitted work to the Hurricane Review, and um, somebody who shall not be named sent me back some edits, but his edits are always to the point. They're grammatical, they're typos. You know, if you say it this way, it's more likely to be this. So it's not rewriting someone's work, it's just saying, you know, here are some changes, and that is a lot more tolerable. Like, did someone tell you, I hate the first half of your piece, you know, I'll just publish the second. However, if someone sends you something really long, you can pick the part of it you like and say, we don't have the space to publish the whole thing, but we like this part. And I would just say, however you address people, be delicate, be sensitive, and, you know, think a little bit about who they might be. And be prepared for them to be a little angry with you, <coughs> because nobody likes to be rejected. There's one other thing. Um, you might meet these people later. <laughs> they might come up to you later. Yeah. When I was in uh, when I was at SUNY Purchase, there was there's a newspaper there, and they did a literary supplement, and I edited it. It was the first thing that I ever edited, and. Um, while I was assembling the piece, you know, in, in the facility for it, one of my friends came in with some poems by another woman, and um, and uh, you know, and I was feeling a lot of pressure. I probably could have figured out how to put them in, but I was young and inexperienced, and and I, I turned it down. I just I I, I was at my limit. Twenty years later. Um, I was an ex accepting an award for that my mom had received at like the American Poetry Society in a fancy place. Like uh, Alice Walker was there, uh, Cecilia Vicuña, like famous, you know, respected writers. While I'm like milling about, you know, trying to make small talk with Sonia Sanchez, and I see this woman again, and she comes up to me, and she says hello. And then the first thing she says is, "Why did you turn down my poems all those years ago?" And, I just said I was, you know, I said it was dumb. I shouldn't have done that, and I apologized. So that that could happen. You know, it's worth thinking about. I've also had, you know, we did three issues of a magazine in San Francisco. We started collecting stuff for a fourth, but we didn't get it done. And one of those one of those people became a close friend of mine later in life and told me about it. You know, at least that time I could say we had ran out of gas and didn't have any way to plan it. But yeah, it can be difficult. You know, and it, it remained difficult. So, you know, just be nice, try to be compassionate to everybody. That's the best thing you can do. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You know, that that poem reminds me of um, uh, the last one. That we, I think you mentioned this yesterday, but kind of like a Joe Brainerd, I remember. Yeah. You're not saying I remember, and they're just kind of the more anecdotal, I guess. It, you know, it came right out of that form. Um, yeah. There's several people in here who have worked that form because they're in my class. Yeah, yeah so it's a great form. It's, I remember. You just start each section, I remember it, and you can say absolutely anything. And Joe Brainerd wrote it. He didn't write it all. It, like, now it's collected his book published by Penguin that maybe a couple hundred pages, but he wrote it in several installments, like, over a number of years. Uh, there was I Remember, and then there was I Remember More, and then there was I Remember Christmas, and, you know, it's like this mix of... Uh, I remember 16 times, which is an old, older song, or you know, um, you know, or details about the way things look in Tulsa in the 50s, and then it'll mix in like early sexual experiences and the awkward of it, awkwardness of those, and then it'll mix in, you know, just other kinds of details and friendships. So you get everything. Today, JFK uh, will throw something heavy. Yeah. yeah, and I, I was consciously thinking of that form, but I excluded. Using I remember because he already did that, and a lot of other people have done that, and it's it's almost a self-conscious form at this point. So it's more like, how do I do the same thing? I thought of that movie. I think it's called. 
Centropa or something like that. There's a movie that's this like, you know, narration that's like, you're on a trip, you're just speeding into the abyss. You don't know how you feel about it. I wanted, I wanted that kind of tone of voice. <laughs> You, uh, okay, you first then. What are you doing currently? Um, so you're talking? You mean writing wise? Um, I haven't written, I've written a couple of poems. I've been taking a break because um, a lot of the stuff that I wrote, that I've written has come from like an emotionally draining negative space. And I've been doing this for like 40 years now, and I don't want everything I do to come out the same way. And COVID happened, and just negativity everywhere, and I didn't, I didn't want to be feeling it and also just pushing it back out into the world. So, so I took a pause. But um, there are sort of two ways that I'm, one thing that I started doing, also I've written a lot of short poems, which I usually write in one scene. And I wanted to figure out how to write a longer word. And one of the ways to do that was to, you know, get my notebook and um, think of a phrase while I'm walking around, write it down. And then if I think of another one, great. And if not, I just keep carrying my notebook around. And I just let these phrases accumulate. It doesn't matter if they're connected, um, you know, in terms of linear storytelling. They're linear, they are linearity simply because I'm writing them in specific order. You know, and and, um, and I just, you know, I try to create a mood and a situation and uh, maybe include quotations, maybe include, you know, signs I see on the street that have that sort of pop and blow away. And uh, yeah, and, and they, they give me, they get me away from the idea that I'm going to write some perfect little thing that I know that everyone will relate to. And, and they, they engage like larger mystery of existing in a world where you don't know everything, you know, you're trying to keep your finger on it, but you can't, you know, and there's, and there's, you know, and there are worlds going on around you that you're not thinking about that, that don't have anything to do with, you know, how, what kind of person you think you are. So that's one thing. The other thing is I started teaching a workshop in New York City, and um, second class is tomorrow, first class is last Tuesday. We talk for an hour, we write for half an hour, and then we talk some more for half an hour. What kind of teacher would I be if I didn't write at the same time? So I'm just going for it in those moments and just sort of letting it happen and trying to follow the flow of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, the 80 pages for like a poetry book, or would you just say go with the chat book, kind of network, and go with the short? That's a good question. Um, First, by the age of self-publication, I think you're meaning like the proliferation of, of possibility that computers offer. But it's always been the age of self-publication. Like the most uh, Whitman, you know, Blake, um, you know, the, all that is home, home enterprises. Uh, it's Amazon right now. You can just submit your right, thing right. and they'll publish it on Amazon. Yeah, and I mean, that has a certain amount of value too, but it might not get you super far. It won't get you far with that community. You know, if, right. a, if a, a thousand or a hundred thousand people do that and don't tell anybody about their books, then, you know, it's going to be rather random if you have an audience or not. Um, as for the second part of the question, depends on who you are, depends on where you are, but you can do both. Um, my manuscripts are often accumulations, like collections of the chapbooks, but unified. Sometimes, um, and I'll change it, you know, like each book, I may have written something that fit into a chapbook, but it might not fit into the book. And something I left out of the chapbook might actually work better in the book, or I might see it differently because a certain amount of time has passed. So, you know, if, if, if nothing is happening, you know, if you haven't published anything, yeah, self-publish, you know. How else are people going to see your work? You know, make a hundred copies of, uh, you know, a homemade 20 poem production and give it to people who you think will care, you know, or people who, are, who you like will say something to you, you know. Um, send, it to, send it to random writers, you know, if you, if you have a contact. But what? Try things. 
you know, you, you sort of have to be reaching out. I think is the main thing. If you want, if you want response, you have to be reaching out, and you do it in whatever avenue is available. Thank you. So, the chat with my students here uh, hear a lot, a lot about this, and I you know, I say in the poetry class we make the chat book at the end of that. You know, and yeah. I'm just, you guys have heard me say this many times. You know, if you really like it, make make, some, make it reproducible. Make several copies and. You know, uh, you have it then. And open books takes chat books. They'll sell them for you. And yeah. you can give them to people, send them to people, send them to Eddie. Yeah, send me yeah. If you have any with you, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, someone has to know that you're a writer for them to ask you for your writing. You know, it's kind of as simple as that. Yeah. Eddie, there's one thing I didn't, what I didn't tell you in this, in my, brief introduction and didn't say it in the bio either is that he's a, a singer songwriter uh, I guess I, I call track for his band and those were various manifestations yeah of that um, uh, I feel tractor is the title of a poem that's in my first book and um, and I made it my band name my band uh, rotating cast of characters I, I, I've, I've managed to play a lot of shows over the year but I, I um, I think of songwriting as an extension, another form within my poetry writing. And the people who ask me to play music tend to be poets. So I mostly I play poetry readings. Um, every once in a while, I get a good kid somewhere. Um, and it's super fun. And it, it's something, and one thing I tell myself is, you know, it's awesome if you're super talented right away, really good at something intuitively. For the rest of us, you just have to work at it, you know? Like, if you do something once, you'll be okay at it. You know, if you're if it's not at the highest level of your expectation and you quit, that's really your fault, you know. But if you do something once and then you do it a hundred more times, you'll be better. You know, you know you're gonna improve. There was a moment at purchase where I took guitar lessons when I was a kid. I directly after my dad died, you know, it was like that's something to do. And um and I learned a certain amount of stuff, but I didn't understand how or why it worked, and I didn't know how to replicate it. I knew only that I felt better when I played the guitar, even if it was out of tune, even if I couldn't sing. And, um, and I, I gave myself 10 years. I said, if I keep doing this, I'm going to take the pressure off. I'm not going to worry about whether I'm good. I'm just going to worry about whether I'm doing it. And in 10 years, most likely, I'll be better than I Less than 10 years later, I got to play. So I started playing shows in front of people and writing songs. And I um, mentioned Thurston Moore, uh, Sonic Youth. He actually invited me to open up for him once. Um, again, it was because I was a poet. I had help with that. I was a musician since I was going to play music. But like, you know, he, uh, he also asked Ivy Miles, the, the writer Ivy Miles, to open. It was like for one of his um, demolished thoughts, I think, was the album. And it was at Music Hall of Williamsburg, and it's like the best gig I ever got. I got paid. I did not get paid to play music, but I got paid. And I got a green room, and um, and I got to go in his room and drink some of his whiskey, and then have Kim Gordon come up and ask me if she could have some too, even though it was his whiskey. Like, that was the best. You know, hasn't happened again, but, um, you know, it's worth it. I don't, don't particularly want to have, I, you know, I don't think I could be a person who tour or or to deal with um, high levels of fame, or being on TV shows, or all that stuff. Like my interest is making music and playing. So if I can get a good opportunity, that's great. But I'm just happy to keep doing it, you know. And if I feel like if I get good enough at it, sooner or later someone wants me to do it again. And that's kind of that's how it's worked. Well, uh, if no one has any more questions, I do want, we'll wind down here, but um, I do want to mention, and I should have said this at the beginning, but James is back here from the PSC Bookstore, and he has books that, that he has edited, and I think he has the last poetry uh, volume, uh, More Gone. Yes, Get the Money and More Gone. So those are for purchase, and Eddie, I suppose you'll be happy to sign books. Yeah. Yeah, sign books, answer questions. If you have any interest, come down. Yeah, so we can mingle. Look at these ones. Yeah. So thank you all for coming, and uh, once again, Eddie, thank you very much.